Hello and welcome to The First Draft, a new podcast by the Foreign Policy Research Institute in which we'll examine the ideas emanating from world affairs over the next few months. I'm Robert Kaplan, Robert Strauss who pay chair in geopolitics. And I'm Dominic Green, Senior Fellow in the FPRI's Center for the Study of America and the West. Hello and welcome to The First Draft, a podcast from the Foreign Policy Research Institute with Robert D. Kaplan, the FPRI's Robert Strauss Hupe Chair in Geopolitics, and me, Dominic Green, fellow at the FPRI's Centre for the Study of America and the West. Robert, it's not often we find ourselves discussing the British royal family, but it's in the news. To, I, I'm not entirely sure what the story is, but it appears that a photograph showing Kate, Princess of Wales, and her children was released and then withdrawn. Can you enlighten me on the meaning well, of Well, I thought it was a beautiful photograph, you know, a really good-looking, nice family. And then the media jumped up and down. It's been doctored. It's been played with. But they never explained how exactly. And the more you read, the more confusing it became. You know, it wasn't clear whether it was a major doctoring or it was just some minor things that, they. you know, know, I, I wasn't sure whether the media was making a story out of something that was not a story which the media does a lot, and which average people would just shrug their shoulders at. I think one thing the media is very good at is making stories about the media. And and I wondered, in in that sense, you were saying, we feel that we're missing something, but perhaps it seems very obvious to the people who are making the story. And I wondered if it was to do with this broader issue of trust and verification, because it's one thing to, to try and find sources to corroborate a written report, And it's another thing uh, to establish the reality of a photograph. And one of the things that I found when I was reading about this was that the photograph agencies who collate and then distribute material to the outlets, they have an informal standard for what constitutes an acceptable amount of tweaking of images. In other words, it's okay to airbrush, as we used to say. It's just not okay to change, say, the color of somebody's sweater or move their arm around. So this would actually suggest that part of their, their anxiety about this is that they're already knee deep in a kind of acceptable falsification of reality. And I wondered if this perhaps had some connection to the march of AI and the deep fakes, which uh, recently Taylor Swift was the victim of, and and which I know there are court cases coming up. And indeed, the entire question of of the state of the president's health, which is a a running theme now on uh, both sides of the aisle. Yeah. Could you figure out whether it was a massive doctoring or it was just some small airbrushing? I mean, I couldn't. None of the pieces I read explained it. Well, I did many hard hours of research on Twitter about this because they are these people used to be called citizen journalists, which was a good thing. And then when they started getting ahead of the allegedly professional reporters, they then became a bad thing and a threat to our, our sense of reality and, and democracy and so on. But the citizen journalists who follow the royal family are complete fanatics. And as far as I can tell, they may even have swapped in Kate's head. They oh, really? decapitated a photo and then and then imposed it, as well as moved her children's arms into line and possibly changed one of the colours of their sweaters. I, I would imagine that chopping someone's head off, although it has happened before in British history, um, would constitute a, a red line in these that, matters. That happened in communist history. Yes. For, you know, in very famously so, I believe Milan Kundera wrote about it, where there were seven men at the May Day parade of the Czech Politburo, and then one got axed, you know, literally axed, you know, yeah. you know, fell out of favor and was just killed or something. And then they redistributed the photograph with just six people instead of seven. And they used to do this a lot actually, you know, on, you know, that's why the media became fixated with following the photographs of May Day parades on the podium. But this was a common technique of the of the Soviets. Yes. And and image management has become 
great deal of the sort of daily uh, bread of politics as opposed to actual policies uh, merely being seen to be political. It, it seems to be the, the main aim now, which brings us, I feel, uh, to the dire state of British politics, where people keep trying to be seen to do something and nothing ever changes, except it all seems to go slightly further downhill. There is an election uh, due almost certainly before the end of the year, possibly, people are saying, in May. When you look at Britain, what do you think? Um, Be nice. I think, really, the world's oldest modern democracy. I think of a quality of debates in the House of Commons that are much that are real debates, which is a quality so much higher than in the United States, where people in the United States Senate you can get by trading sound bites. Essentially, you know, it's a question of soundbite one-upmanship. But in, in, in the British Parliament, I always felt you really had to be quick on your feet and you had to be extremely articulate and knowledgeable while being quick on your feet. Yeah, this is true. I, I think perhaps the rise of the soundbite and British politics has also been sound bitten in that way. The rise of the soundbat, I think, does reflect the 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 takeover of of well all life really by media and the way that it has reshaped ways of talking and even the, the political process. One striking thing to me is if you look at the polling in Britain at the moment, the Conservative Party is in a complete nosedive. They're more than twenty points behind in some polls, and barring uh, a disaster of the kind the Labour Party often managed to pull off, uh, Labour will be the government uh, in. A year's time. And this is striking because this would place Britain pretty much out of step with virtually every other Western democracy. If you look at the polling for the European Parliament's uh, elections, for instance, in June, it looks like the harder right will, will gain even at the expense of the centre right. If you look at the way the polls are going in France, say, well, where Marine Le Pen is, is well ahead of any other candidate. Uh, Britain, meanwhile, And what happened in left. Portugal just a few days yes, ago. Yes, yeah, yeah. And let alone yeah. the polling in the United States, where Donald Trump has been ahead of Joe Biden in swing states for months. I have a theory about this, about why okay. this is. Right. The, right. It's because <laughs> the default parties are the ones who are suffering the wrath of their publics. And the modern American state was largely the idea of the Democrats and was then built consensually with the Republicans having to catch up. While modern British politics was created by the conservatives who were the most successful party there. So Whoever the institutional party is, they're the ones who are getting a kicking from the voters. And that, of course, is then likely to place Britain oddly out of step with the rest of the world. How much does that matter is the question. If, can, Let me British, counter yeah, that a bit. And this comes from your own writing in the Wall Street Journal, which is that the reason the conservatives are 20 points behind is not because it's the left that's ascendant in Great Britain. It's that it's it's a very like mealy mouth, center right, conser old fashioned conservative party in charge with who else but David Cameron as foreign minister. Whereas, the, you know, Britain still hasn't had this, you know, the, the right wing populist revolution yet, which will probably happen when the Republic, when the late, when the conservatives are out of power. Well, and that is an absolutely brilliant analysis. And, yeah. and yes, and I, I completely agree with it. <laughs> like some years later, the populist right coming to power in Britain. It's just that it's just that the sequencing is wrong in Britain. It's not that the trend isn't there. Yeah, I think that's true. And uh, I'm glad that I said that. And um, I, I think uh, this is a matter of political culture as well. Uh, the French will be burning sheep on their motorways uh, by now, but in Britain, they just grumble. Um, and that question of political temperament brings us, I feel, to the um, American elections, which the, the season seems to be getting underway with the uh, State of the Union speech, which is a highly uh, partisan one, like everything else. There's a possibility to think, well, you know, it's the campaign is done. Or has it just begun? It's an interesting question because technically the campaign is done. Both President Biden and Donald Trump have mathematically secured enough delegates to be their party's nominee. But in a way, it isn't done because all kinds of crazy things happen in elections. And, you know, it's a long way to, to know to the first week in November. 
both men are very elderly. So we could, and yes, true, at that level, particularly the president, you don't just make an appointment for a doctor three months in advance. You see a doctor every morning. It's one of the first things you do. You get your you know, basic life signs checked and all of that. It's a level of health care that average people simply cannot imagine and which really does add years to your life. They, we talk about how much tension there is being president, but on the other hand, it's a life-enhancing job, not only because of the adrenaline, but because of the medical care you're under. So it's always risky to predict health scares for people at that level, kind of. But they're elderly. Anything could happen or rather they could have a stroke, a mild stroke, you know, or, you know, so that's one thing. The other thing is we really have to look at third parties here. And with third parties in America have not ever been successful, I don't believe. But what they have done is they've thrown elections to one side or the other. Famously, Ross Perot throwing the election to Clinton, I believe, in 1992. For some reason, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is very popular. I can't figure out the reason because I think I think he's a flake. You know, he's a spoiled brat flake, but he's popular. And he may pick a sports hero to be his vice presidential candidate from what we've been seeing. And, you know, even if a third party or there are other third parties mentioned, the no labels candidacy, you know, if a third party gets three percent, three or four percent, they could throw the election in one direction or another. Uh, remember, Ross Perot needed a lot more because we weren't so polarized then. And elections were won by generally big majorities where there was no challenges. But in this day and age, when you get election results by a hair's breadth that you don't know who won till 48 or 72 hours later, like the last one, yes, Joe Biden was elected president. This whole thing that he stole the election is a conspiracy theory. Nevertheless, it was a very close election. So if you have a very close election, a, a third party that gets 3%, that's it. They throw it in one direction or another, let alone if they get 10%. Yeah, the margin, uh, or rather the floating voters, who used to be quite a large cohort, have declined now to about 2 to 3% of the electorate. And as we know, the crucial states, again, is a handful of states where tens of thousands of votes can swing it. So that actually increases the the leverage of potentially for third party candidates, rather than having to uh, fight a, a big national campaign, say, in the way that. Yeah, we did. also haven't factored in, you know, the possibility of Trump having a, a conviction, what that would do to it. Again, swinging the votes by two percent in the polls. That's it. Yep, this you don't is have true. to have yep. a five, 10 percent swing anymore. So that's one thing that can happen. What I tend to believe now is that the media is cackling about how Trump's in the lead in the polls, but we don't have a national election in the United States. We have 50 statewide elections, winner take all elections for electoral votes. And as you alluded to, just 10,000 votes or so could swing a state. And that's why even in this highly polarized climate, middle of the road swing voters tend to be the ones that determine, you know, who's going to be president. And given the uh, former President Trump's proclivity for knifing himself in the back, for saying outrageous things, for doing outrageous things, this or, you know, you know, having a conviction or something, this could really affect swing voters negatively and throw the election to Biden. This is what the, the, the Wall Street Journal's editorial page has essentially been arguing a bit, been arguing in that direction that Trump is the weakest candidate against Biden, despite what the polls say. Yeah, and I think that is true. And I think most people, understandably, don't want to be more involved than they have to be. And of course, the uh, small number of swing states allows a much larger number of non-swinging states for people to effectively tune out. And uh, you could say that finally the uh, American democracy has achieved the same state as the uh, European ones, and everybody detests the candidates and doesn't want even to think about what it's going to be like. 
Yeah, well, the Iranian elections, which was just last week or two weeks ago, I think the turnout was 25 percent or at the most 40 percent mm -hmm. or something. They couldn't get people to, to show up to vote. And we could have a bit of that in this election if most people perceive that there are just a few swing states and just this general dissatisfaction with the candidates. And and this effortlessly segues us into foreign policy. That there, there is a an ongoing problem for the United States uh, government in getting uh, weapons to Ukraine in adequate quantities. Yeah. Uh, this week, uh, the administration made an emergency uh, gift of three hundred million dollars worth, but the big sixty billion uh, dollar uh, package, part of a much larger one, um, is still stuck uh, in Congress. Has the strategy of of limiting and limited weapons shipments, and also uh, sending uh, qualities as opposed to quantities as well, shifting gradually to more and more sophisticated weapons. Has this worked as a strategy? Well, first of all, there was a very interesting piece in the New York Times of all places recently. They've just started a series on nuclear bombs. And one thing about the Times, you can criticize it all day long, but their pieces are fact-checked because they are part of the mainstream media, like Wall Street Journal pieces are fact-checked, you know? So you can trust the facts in them, it, to a, you know, usually to a degree. And the writer was saying, that the U.S. intelligence community felt that if the Ukrainians had attacked Sevastopol, the city in Crimea, or launched a major attack on Crimea, the chances of Putin using a nuclear weapon were 50-50. Uh, so I read that and I said, maybe that's behind the administration's caution in sending weapons to Ukraine, but it's all classified and we haven't heard about it yet. But the moment Biden is out of office or even beforehand, when some of his top people retire, they will write memoirs and they will include this. And they will say, everyone has been beating up on us for not being more aggressive and sending weapons to Ukraine. But we had to think about the bigger picture here, you know? Yeah, yeah, this is the, know, the difficulty, in a way, of having a reactive policy, which is one obviously trying to limit. Right. In other words, the, you know, yeah. it's tough in a media age where the media is screaming at you to do more and more and more. Meanwhile, you have these intelligence assessments coming over your desk, you know, and, you know, with the memory of the Iraq war and Vietnam and, you know, and all of this. Yes, there are no troops in Ukraine. It's a very different, no American troops in Ukraine. It's a very different situation. But you do have this nuclear issue. So it may turn out in two, three years from now that the Biden administration's caution was warranted, you know, or defensible. I don't know. I'm just supposing because I saw that piece in the New York Times and it just jumped out at me, so to speak. Clearly, the policy of limited weapon shipments, you know, um, has not worked or, you know, it's worked to bog down the Russians but not to win the war. And over time, bogging down the Russians is stalemate on the front. Stalemates favor the side that has the biggest well of manpower waiting in the rear and the, big, and the largest amount of ammunition waiting in the rear. And that gradually has shifted to the Russian side. You know, also ru the Russians historically, because they're so is such a weakly institutionalized state and so inefficient. Historically, at the beginning of wars, they do very badly. It's chaos. You know, it's a real fiasco, fiasco. But their ability to suffer, to hunker down means they gradually get the upper hand. This happened in World War II. It happened in war. It didn't happen in World War I because the Tsarist system was so emaciated at that point. But it happened in World War II in previous wars, and it seems to have happened in this war as well. So, and now with this, the Congress thing, you know, Congress won't appropriate this, this money, and everyone is blaming Congress. But I would, in a way, even th this is really, in a way, Congress's dysfunction 
is partly a mechanism of Biden's own perceived weakness as president. Because if Biden was a vigorous, fast on his feet verbally kind of president, he would be barnstorming the country using the bully pulpit saying Congress needs to approve weapons for Ukraine. And you know what? Congress would fall in line. You know, Congress usually does fall in behind the president on a few major issues, no matter hmm. uh, no matter how polarized they may be. So Congress be, being dysfunctional, not falling in line, is, I think, a representation of Biden's own perceived weakness. I, I think that that makes absolute sense. Now, this morning, I, I woke up and I saw an email in my inbox that said, Robert Kaplan, my obituary. And I, and I thought, are you trying to get ahead? Of, of bad news here. Uh, but then I opened it uh, and it actually said, Robert Kaplan, my obituary for William Whitworth. Yes, William Whitworth was the editor of the Atlantic magazine from 1980 to 2000. He was actually hired in 1980 and took over in 1981. In other words, he had a 20 year run as editor. Before that, he was a top editor, at, the deputy editor of The New Yorker. And he was actually being considered to be the top editor of The New Yorker and The Atlantic at the same time in 1980, because The New Yorker editor was retiring. And so Bill had a choice of which one of those two venerable magazines to take. And imagine having that kind of a choice, you know, you know, and it's a testament to his low key, easy to get along with quiet, absolute brilliance as an editor at The New Yorker. He he reduced a book by Robert Caro about the about Robert Moses, which was six hundred and fifty thousand words down to four twenty five thousand word chunks that would run. He was a brilliant condenser, you know, very thoughtful. And at the end of the day, he chose to go to the Atlantic because as he told me a number of years ago, he knew he would have a better relationship with the owner there. That, he, you know, he would be more independent. Uh, he had told me that William Shaw, the previous editor at The New Yorker, was very unhappy at the end of his working at the end of his working life because of difficulties. And he didn't want to inherit that. And at, at The Atlantic, he felt he would have more freedom, you know, which, as it turned out, he did. Now, people have been writing pieces about what a brilliant editor he was, you know, how he dealt with writers you know, how formal and well-dressed he was, very low-key, sort of embodying all the things that we miss now from the media in terms of politeness, always considering the other side and all its nuance. You know, that's what Bill Whitworth basically was about. There was another side to him, which I wrote in this, in this appreciation for him in the national interest, which is, that Bill was a liberal. You know, you can't edit the, the Atlantic magazine without being a liberal. You can't be at the New Yorker as the deputy editor about to be editor without being a liberal. It just goes with the territory. But Bill was a liberal in the in, in the in the most crucial sense, he was he he inhabited uncertainties. He wasn't always sure where the truth lie or where the proper opinion was. And that led him to periodically publish major conservative pieces in in the liberal Atlantic. And the Atlantic, the Atlantic under Bill Whitworth in the latter part of the 20th century, became a go-to place for publishing some of the most controversial and eminent public policy articles. And I mentioned an article he published, an essay he wrote, published called Broken Windows by the uh, political scientist James Q. Wilson and his associate Skelling, I, uh, Kelling, I forget his first name. And it was about how if you prosecute people for jumping subway turnstiles and just breaking windows, your murder rate's going to go down. 
because it shows you have a low tolerance for any kind of crime. In other words, law and order works. And this was not a liberal idea, essentially. Uh, Whitworth published it. Rudy Giuliani, back in the days when he was normal, Rudy Giuliani <laughs> was mayor of New York and adopted it. And guess what? Crime went down dramatically in New York City. As a result, he also published a piece by the eminent late Middle East historian at Princeton, Bernard Lewis, called The Roots of Muslim Rage, which you probably couldn't publish in such a magazine today because it was it, it told like, I, I would say, difficult truths and dealt with culture you know, in civilization. And that piece had an effect on Harvard professor Samuel Huntington, which led indirectly to Huntington's clash of civilizations theory. At a time when the liberal media was making ferocious fun at Vice President, Republican Vice President Dan Quayle for defending two parent, traditional two parent families, Whitworth published a cover story called Dan Quayle Was Right. And it was by a political sci social scientist, Barbara Dafoe Whitehead, saying that guess what? Traditional two parent families actually work. A better in, bring, in bringing up children. So this was Whitworth. He was a liberal, but he had an open mind. You could convince him of things. If he felt something was well argued, then he felt he needed to publish it. Well, I, I think we're heading towards the, the conclusion that editing is good and airbrushing is bad and that uh, the proper role for the media is uh, not to be amplifying uh, power, but to be amplifying the debates which can create policy. Yeah, yeah, very I'm, much so. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. You've been listening to The First Draft, a podcast from the Foreign Policy Research Institute with Robert D. Kaplan and Dominic Green. Many thanks for listening. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe to The First Draft on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to be notified about new episodes. To explore more podcasts and upcoming events, please visit us on www.fpri.org.